then I'm going to throw a pile of practice activities at you, just as many as I can get through. Uh, whatever I don't have time to get through, you'll find these alternatives on, on the, the blog handout. Okay, so the, uh, the theory, first of all, and this is not terribly complicated, the return of translation. The, uh, one, of the, the, one of the best books, I think, published in English language teaching in the last five years has been a book uh, by Guy Cook called Translation in Language Teaching. It's won many, many prizes, uh, and I think quite rightly so. It's stimulating um, for everybody. It, it has so much to offer, thoroughly recommend it, even if you never read any other ELT book, this is one that I would recommend at the moment. And in this book, uh, in the introduction, Guy says this, translating should be a major aim of, uh, and means of language teaching and a major measure of success. This argument is a major break with tradition. Um, and everything that I uh, will be saying now is, is kind of in support of Guy Cook's basic statement here. The translation should become a, a central part of our teaching practices. He says that it's a major break with tradition, and I would quibble with him here. It would seem that in some traditions it might be a break, uh, but when I started doing the research, I found that it wasn't really a major break with tradition, at least in the research writing that I came across. Back in 2003, um, Henry Widdison wrote that translation has been in exile too long. So he's arguing precisely the same thing in 2003. Going further back, Vivian Cook in 2001, uh, Costas Gabrielatis in 1998, Mario Rinvalucri in 1990, Julian Edge back in 1987, and Rod Belitho, if he's in the room, um, was saying this kind of thing way, way back in 1983, before I was born. Uh, so I, I, would, I would quibble with Guy Cook's claim that it is a major break with tradition. I mean, there is clearly a long tradition here, but there is a problem because it's not something which people really talk about. Guy Cook, uh, at another point, as I said earlier, he talks about translation as a pariah in language teaching, this dirty dog that you don't want to go anywhere near. If you look at the, the basic teacher training, the standard teacher training manuals, uh, books like Jim Scrivener's uh, Learner, Learner Teaching, like uh, Jeremy Harmer's The Practice of English Language Teaching, etc., they will mention translation, but typically only in passing, uh, or not at all. It's simply absent. If you look at conference programs over the last 10 years, you will not really discover any um, reference to translation except for the occasional speaker like Rod Belitho, who <laughs> will still be trying to persuade people that this is something that they should consider. So it's been largely ignored. The, uh, the situation for native speakers of English, native speaker teachers of English, um, is clearly more problematic if they're working with multilingual classes. But in the typical training courses run for the native speakers, the Cambridge uh, CELTA and DELTA courses and the Trinity College courses, translation is simply not even on the syllabus. It's totally ignored. Um, so, it is common practice, as I've suggested, to hold translation practices up to ridicule, uh, simply to laugh at them. Um, and that is why perhaps the most important thing is for me to suggest ways of doing things which are not ridiculous, which do not involve simply pointing at students around the classroom and asking them to badly translate a text which they have no interest in. Um, if we talk about a return of translation, it seems legitimate to ask, did translation ever go away? Um, I've just heard of an anecdote here uh, from Istanbul where um, teachers simply not allowed to use the mother tongue in the classroom. They won't get hit, but they could be punished. It's fairly common in many language schools, uh, private language schools, it is taboo, it's uh, the school policy never to use the mother tongue. Whether this policy is followed or not, I don't know. Um, but did it ever really go away? And uh, it would seem actually that it never did, and it never could. Even if the private language schools have, by and large, outlawed translation, the private language schools are a very, very small segment of English language teaching nationally and internationally. In universities around the world, uh, as Cook points out, translation is the norm at university level teaching. It continues to be the norm. It depends very much on the faculty, um, but in most countries that I visit, that is what happens. And my experience, uh, again, in most countries, and perhaps most acutely in Belgium with my own children, whose mother tongue is French, not English, who are having to learn English at school, is it's all really about translation. 
unless that is the inspector is going to visit their class on a particular day, in which case the teacher probably won't use translation because they'll be worried. Yeah? So it would seem, but it's very hard to know, it would seem that translation never really has gone away. Um, when I mentioned this talk, the Boos and Hurrays talk, and people said, boo to translation, when I pushed them more, I said, well, is it always bad? And they say, well, no, not all the time. You know, sometimes it's appropriate and we use it a little. And you push them more and more, and you discover that actually they use mother tongue and translation quite a lot in their classrooms. And we know from research that's been done that teachers consistently under-report the amount of mother tongue they use in their classrooms. And they do this presumably because of the perception that it's not a good thing to do. Shouldn't we all be like the native speakers who can only speak English in the classroom? And I'll argue very strongly, no, we shouldn't. The native speakers who are monolingual uh, shouldn't probably be in the classroom unless they understand the language of their students. Something which is clear. So in practical terms, translation probably has never gone away. It's still out there massively. Um, although it's not terribly fashionable, and so it may be that the teachers that use translation don't come to conferences. Yeah? That, that's a possibility. The second point worth making, I think, is that translation is in any case inherent, it's intrinsically inherent, um, in any foreign language learning. What, um, and I'll elaborate a little bit more on this in a second, what I mean by this is that uh, translating not necessarily translation of Jane Austen texts, but the process of translating is what we all tend to do when we're learning anyway. And whether or not you insist on using English only in the classroom, you can bet your life that a large number of your students, if not all of them, will be mentally translating. They'll be trying to figure out what it means. And it is such, such a natural, normal thing to do uh, that you're never going to get away from it. It's going to happen. And if it's going to happen anyway, irrespective of what you say and pretend or what the school policy is, it seems to be ridiculous to keep it as something covert, which we don't really talk about and exchange ideas about because it's embarrassing. Let's make it an overt tool. The students are going to do it anyway. Let's get them to do it well. And that's something that we as teachers, of course, can do. So did translation go away? No, I don't think it did. Um, and so much the better, perhaps. I'll provide a very brief summary of the sorts of reasons that are being quoted for bringing translation back if it ever went away. You'll understand why I have a picture of a dragoman in a short while. The first of these reasons I'll call epistemological, but I, I suppose I could call it political. What I mean by this is that the discourse of English language teaching has been dominated and is still dominated by native speaker teachers. If you look at the, uh, the list of plenary speakers here, guess where we're all from and what our mother tongue is. Look at the keynote speakers, uh, the majority of them, what's their mother tongue, where are they from? These are the people, and I suppose I could include myself, who have been dominating the discourse for a long, long, long time. It's not just that we are native speakers. There's something else that we have in common, and this is true of almost almost all of the plenary speakers and many of the keynote speakers. We share a background in private language schools. That's where most of us come from. And there are a couple of exceptions among the plenary speakers, but even those whose background isn't essentially private language schools, and I think actually Professor Crystal is probably the only one, we have very close connections with those private language schools. And by the private language schools, I don't mean just the chains of schools or the well-known ones like Bell and International House, I include among them the British Council as a chain of language schools, of private language schools, because they operate in very, very similar ways, or they have done traditionally. So these are the people that have um, dominated the discourse. And the context, the background that we come from, is a multilingual context, um, typically in the UK, but it could be in the US or Australia, where we have really not much choice but to use English only in the classroom because we have so many nationalities there. We simply don't have the expertise very often to talk about it in any other way. So it's not perhaps surprising that people of my ilk um, have been very negative about translation for a long, long time. And I 
yes, I suppose I should be apologetic. Many, many times in my career as a teacher trainer have I told teachers not to use the mother tongue because that was a kind of, kind of reflex reaction, what I say to people. I wish I hadn't, but it's too late now. But there is a shift taking place. There is quite a, a major shift taking place as the influence of the private language schools, the UK-based private language schools, decreases. The kind of influence that the international houses, bells, Eurocenters and British Council of this world are having now is much, much less than 20 years ago. Much, much less. The course books, which were previously all written by people like me, I suppose, are now increasingly being written by local people, or at least joint authored by more local writers. There is a big change taking place there. And uh, at the international IATFL conferences, they make a point of um, getting speakers from all over, not just um, white middle-class Brits. So there is a change taking place, but at the same time as this change is taking place, there is a big debate about the ownership, not just of ELT discourse, but the ownership of English. And the English as an international language, or English as a lingua franca movement, which you must have heard of and been aware of, although it might be dominated by one or two native speakers, is almost equally dominated by others, like Barbara Seidelhofer, who's a native German speaker. And people are saying, yeah, hang on, hang on, the the native speakers don't own this language, it's not for the native speakers to decide what's acceptable or not. So there is a shift. And as we shift away from this domination of the native speaker, private language center oriented teacher, to a more um, non-native speaker, although I know the term is politically incorrect, I'll use it. So a non-native speaker teacher who's more likely to be based in a secondary school or a university, it's inevitable that we're going to be turning to translation again, since that's more likely to have been their background and what they're used to. So there is a change in the sort of the ownership of the knowledge. That's what I mean by the epistemological. That's the first big reason why the shift is taking place. The second category um, is cognitive. Um, Henry Widdison and others, and almost certain Rob Belitho sitting at the back here, uh, have argued that the, um, the negative attitude towards translation, which has been so powerful, has never ever been informed by any research. The reasons for it have perhaps been practical in some cases, or they've been political, or it's simply power-mongering. There has never been any research to indicate that translation and the use of mother tongue in the classroom is a bad thing. If you do come across some kind of that research, I'll be fascinated to hear about it, and I'd love to be in touch with you on the handout blog thing. I'd love to know more. But in actual fact, it goes further than that, because recent researchers are simply arguing not only that L1 use in the classroom is not a bad thing, they are now beginning to argue that exclusive use of L2, the target language, English, for example, is a much worse thing, using and insisting on an English-only environment, the research now is suggesting is not a terribly good idea. It may be detrimental to the learners' learning processes. And the reasons for that, you might think, well, why, are really very straightforward. Learning a language is at least in part about the acquiring of new knowledge. You only acquire new knowledge by building it on previous knowledge. And your previous knowledge, the most significant previous knowledge you'll bring to the classroom, is your own language. The mother tongue, or possibly the second language, I mean, when I'm learning other languages, I'm trying to learn German at the moment. When I'm learning German, I bring two resources to it, both English and French. But it's those previous linguistic resources which are our richest resources. And to ban that from the classroom, that's mad. It's just absolutely crazy. Um, the arguments that were used, although none of these have been really demonstrated, is that using L1 uh, would lead to negative transfer. Increasingly now there's a consensus, uh, so mistakes would get taken over. There's now a consensus, I think, that if you use a translation in L1 appropriately, that it's the most effective way of avoiding those kinds of L1 transfer problems. Yeah? 
Um, I can't give an example in Turkish, but it's, it's fairly obvious for anyone who speaks French or Spanish, where you have a tense which looks very similar to the English present perfect, but is really rather different, that the best way of sorting it out is through the use of translation and looking at the differences. Yeah? The same, I think, is true um, in languages where the article system is an issue. So we have...